Hey, it's Jay Schuler. Welcome back to the Everybody Hates Shoe Podcast, episode 207, The Confederacy of America. Take the dive. There are ideas that come from both Democrats and Republicans that I hate and love. Both parties can have good ideas and bad ideas. To not hear someone out just because they happen to identify with one party a little more isn't productive. But that's what some politicians and talking heads want. They want you to feel like you have to choose or that the only way to be a free thinker is to choose a certain side. How about we do our own research and form our own opinions based on facts with supported evidence? There's radical and then there's crazy, right? Someone's beliefs can be so far left or right to your core beliefs that you deem their view radical compared to your beliefs. Then there's Marjorie Taylor Greene. Nikki Haley, former South Carolina governor who's running for the Republican presidential nomination, introduced the idea of politicians having to take mandatory competency tests. We'll have term limits for Congress. (laughs) And mandatory mental competency tests for politicians over 75 years old. I believe they all should have to take competency tests. You can't tell me all of these politicians are competent. Just look at the pathological liar, George Santos. I'm not a fraud. I'm not a a criminal. A lot of people overstate in their resumes. The 34-year-old claimed to have worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. He confessed he only worked for a company that did business with both of them. Santos also claimed to have graduated from Baruch in 2010. But now he says he never graduated from any college. And Marjorie Taylor Greene who seems like she's running for the Confederate vice president nomination alongside Trump. A national divorce is not a civil war. It's actually separating by red states and blue states um, and making state rights and state power a lot stronger than it is right now. When Nikki Haley says we need to test the competency of our politicians, these two are who she should have been referring to, not just 70 year olds, which should have been Don Lemon's response. She says people, you know, politicians or something are not in their prime. Nikki Haley isn't in her prime. Sorry. When a woman is considered to be in her prime in her 20s and 30s and maybe 40s. What do you talk? Wait. That's not according to me. Prime for what? Uh, It depends. I mean, it's just like. Not that women in their 50s are past their prime, but that this should be a requirement for anyone in public office. This idea should be welcomed. It should be mandatory for every politician who wishes to serve the American people. It should be because I think we can all agree Miss Green is out of her mind. Nikki Haley in 2010. At the time, the Confederate battle flag was still flown on the South Carolina State House grounds, which she said wasn't racist, but something that is tradition and people feel proud of. For those groups that come in and say they have issues with the Confederate flag, I will work to talk to them about it. I will work and talk to them about the heritage and how this is not something that is racist. This is something that is a tradition that people feel proud of. You mean the Confederacy, which lost the Civil War? If you believe that, which we'll get into, because someone agrees with them, right? They're in office. It wasn't until 2015, after a white supremacist gunned down nine worshippers at a historical black church in Charleston, that she called to have the flag removed. You don't get kudos for that. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a traitor given by her support of the insurrection, which she claimed was a declaration of independence. January 6th was just a riot at the Capitol. And if you think about what our Declaration of Independence says, it says to overthrow tyrants. So there's a clear difference between January 6th and the Marxist communist revolution that Antifa BLM Democrat ground troops. And being an advocate for a nation to divorce. Separating by red states and blue states um, and making state rights and state power a lot stronger than it is right now. Um, it would be shrinking the federal government. I think it's something that we should work towards because, you know, it's kind of the vision that our founding fathers had. She says that her plan is in line with the vision of the founding fathers. And she's not talking about the United States founding fathers. She's talking about the Confederacy founding fathers. She's even saying her constituents agree in private conversations. And I believe her from her talking points. The Congresswoman has another idea as well, banning people who move from blue states to red states from voting for five years so they don't bring their bad politics with them. I actually favor that idea. They've thought this out. Hannity was all about it over on Fox News. How our DOD will still protect the borders. How it would shrink our federal government. They've thought about it. 
for a while because the Confederacy, even if they lost, they never stopped operating as such, evident by all the monuments and street names in the South. I mean, they still fly the flag heavily in the South. They say it represents the South, which it does because the South was a Confederacy. And that history was passed down and celebrated through the South. We're just getting around to taking down these monuments, changing these street names, and it's 2023. They feel their white supremacy and this idea they've created that they are a superior race is being erased. And it's because it's vile, violent, ignorant, and dangerous. Here's a history lesson of what happened after Lincoln was assassinated. And if you want a video about how the party switched, do your own research. I already did the heavy lifting for you. <laughs> Deal? Deal. Let's get into it. It's so interesting when you realize the POV of which history is being written. Upon reading Green saying our nation should divorce, I always go back to the Civil War and the Lincoln assassination because I believe the Confederacy never truly lost. And it starts with Lincoln's death. The word radical has been embedded into our lives at different points depending on what generation you were born in. For me, it was 9-11 and the Iraq War. Radical jihadists and giant letters would come across the screen on the news every night. Now we hear the radical left and the radical right. Lincoln was a Republican. After the Civil War, he wanted to bring the South back into the Union, so he only wanted to punish high-ranking lieutenants and generals. You and I would probably disagree, right? They're traitors. Well, we'd be labeled radical Republicans. Andrew Johnson, a Southern Democrat from Tennessee, succeeded Lincoln and did not get along with the radical Republicans. So what did the radical Republicans of the 1860s want? The radical Republicans felt strongly that the Confederates needed to be punished for their pro-slavery views and should only be readmitted to the Union after they had abolished slavery, among other conditions. They believed the government intervention in states was necessary to ensure civil rights for blacks. What did Andrew Johnson want? Well, his mouth said he was against the Confederates who he deemed traitors, but his pen vetoed all the laws that would help black Americans like the 13th Amendment, and the Freedmen's Bureau, claiming it wasn't fair to assist free blacks since there was no assistance for poor whites and that it would prevent freed blacks from becoming self-efficient, you know, like slave owners, as if it's comparable. And it's the same argument that's used today that they've been trying to use when slavery was only a couple of years old. I guess their resumes were lacking in experience. Get it? Too soon? Okay, moving on. Now, a lot of us know about the 13th and 14th Amendment, but the Freedmen's Bureau was to help African Americans find family members from whom they had become separated from during the war. It arranged to teach them to read and write, skills considered critical by the freedmen themselves as well as by the government. Bureau agents also served as legal advocates for African Americans in both state and federal courts, mostly in cases dealing with family issues. The Bureau encouraged former major planters to rebuild their plantations and pay wages to their formerly enslaved workers. It kept an eye on contracts between the newly free laborers and planters since few freedmen could read and pushed whites and blacks to work together in a free labor market as employers and employees rather than as masters and slaves. By 1869, Southern Democrats in Congress had deprived the Bureau of most of its funding and as a result, it had to cut much of its staff. By 1870, the Bureau had been weakened further due to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Violence across the South from the KKK and terrorist organizations attacked both blacks and sympathetic white Republicans, including teachers, and this continued well into the 60s, prompting the civil rights movements because there had been no movement on our civil rights. And if the Civil War was about the abolishment of slavery, then who really won? My point is, we need to understand our history thoroughly for us to move forward as a nation, as a whole. But if they want to separate, I say we entertain the idea because I don't believe America, as we know it today, is progressing towards a livable future. Let me know what you think in the comments. That's it for today. That's our episode, folks. Peace.